Sean Spicy Spicer has resigned as White House Press Secretary. In his resignation letter to President Trump, Spicer said, quote, it has been a great honor to serve my country, but now you can take this crappy job and shove it, unquote. The resignation letter was tied to a rock and hurled through the window of the Oval Office, according to Jim Acosta of CNN, who was also tied to a rock and hurled through the window of the Oval Office, attached to a letter which read, and you can take this crappy reporter and shove it too. Acosta complained about the incident, saying it should have been on camera so everyone could see him. Acosta said the fact that he was not on camera was a violation of Americans' First Amendment right to see Jim Acosta on camera. The Spicer resignation will have major ramifications on the behind-the-scenes power struggles at the White House, according to people who know nothing about the behind-the-scenes power struggles at the White House, namely Jim Acosta and his anonymous sources, who are also named Jim Acosta by some strange coincidence. According to these so sources, it was the appointment of businessman Anthony Scaramucci, also known as Anthony Scaramucci, that caused Spicer's face to turn scarlet while steam came out of his ears, making a high-pitched whistling noise that sounded like a tea kettle screaming Anthony Scaramucci. Anonymous sources named Jim Acosta also say that presidential aide and evil demon from the bowels of hell Steve Bannon complained about the tea kettle noise, which he said disturbed his thought processes while he was plotting the white supremacy overthrow of the government. This in turn disturbed Bannon's chief rival, Reince Priebus, who complained to the president that he wanted to plot the white supremacist overthrow of the government, which in turn caused Bannon to grab Priebus's nose between the knuckles of his first two fingers and twist it in a circle while Priebus flapped his arms in the air and said, whoop, 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 knuck, knuck, knuck. The New York Times, a former newspaper, celebrated Spicer's resignation with an editorial, which read, quote, we hated Sean Spicer because he yelled at us when we lied, so he was yelling at us all the time, and it damaged our self-esteem. In future, we look forward to lying without getting yelled at, the way we used to do with Obama, who made our jobs much easier because we didn't have to make up our own lies, but could just report his, unquote. Spicer says he has already landed a new job as the chief bouncer at the Double Deuce House in Jasper, Missouri. CNN's Jim Acosta says this is unfair because the Double Deuce doesn't have cameras, so no one can see Jim Acosta. Someone should probably explain to Jim Acosta that no one can see him anyway because he's on CNN. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky dunky, life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky. Ship shaped, dipsy topsy, low and zippity zing. It's a wonderful day, hooray, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray. Oh, hooray, All right, the Clavenless weekend comes to an end, but not everybody made it. Sean Spicer didn't make it through, and O.J. Simpson is out. He's been released. That's what happened to Spicer. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, and he's singles, ladies. He's uh, <laughs> O.J. O.J. What I like about the Sean Spicer O.J. connection, though, is. Saturday Night Live has, ma has made hay imitating Sean Spicer, how wonderful it is, and, every, and the New York Times, and then all the leftist press says, oh, how funny they are, Melissa McCarthy doing Sean Spicer. But they didn't do jokes about O.J. Simpson, because we'll remember that Norm MacDonald was fired from Saturday Night Live because one of the some of the brass at NBC were playing golf with O.J. Simpson, and they didn't let like MacDonald making jokes about uh, him being slaughtering uh, his wife. Michael Knowles is with us today. Uh, he will be talking about Jay-Z. And, uh, you know, I have my hands up and uh, moving my hips like, yeah, and uh, I can't wait. And we'll do, also do a review of Dunkirk. But first, you know, my, my nature box stuff arrived. That was, that was the highlight of the Clavenless yeah. weekend is my nature box stuff arrived. And I have to say, this is, this is my thing because I don't sleep at night. That is when I do most of my like snacking. You know, normally I'm very disciplined. As the night wears on, I start to like pick at things. I'm reading, I'm watching TV, and I like to have something there. So, whatever my wife buys is what I'm going to eat. And so, a lot of times, not that my wife eats junk, she doesn't, but if they're cereal, I'll eat that. But the thing about Nature Box is they send you these snacks that, first of all, they are, they taste terrific. They're actually great. I mean, I was, I was eating this. They have this thing, kettle corn, coffee kettle corn, which is kind of like hits every kind of thing in my head. You know, it's I got coffee. It's I don't know if you know kettle corn. It's so sweet popcorn, yeah. essentially. It's so, so good. These t snacks,
snacks taste great, but they're actually better for you. They're created with high quality ingredients that are free from artificial colors, flavors, or sweeteners, so you can feel great about snacking. You can see on the package where the calories are and all that stuff. NatureBox recently made their service even better because now you can order as much as you want, as often as you want, with no minimum purchase required, and you cancel any time. All you do is you go to naturebox.com and check out the snack catalog. All you have to do is look at the page and you'll immediately be hooked. There are over 100 snacks to choose from and they're always adding new ones. So it always changes. You choose the snacks you want. They deliver them right to your door. And with NatureBox, you won't get bored because it always is changing up. And if you ever try a snack and you don't like it, NatureBox will replace it for free. So right now, you'll save even more. NatureBox is offering our fans 50% off your first order when you go to naturebox.com slash Clavin. How do you spell that? I'm glad you asked me that question, Austin. It's K-L-A-V-A-N, naturebox.com slash Clavin. Gets you 50% off your first order, naturebox.com slash Clavin. Try this co coffee kettle corn. It's obscene. It really is. It's so good. All right. You know, I want to start talking. Everybody's talking about the White House and this and that. And I, I just want to start talking about something else. For, but for a very specific reason, I want to talk about some of the stuff that's going on in Israel. That there's there's all this turmoil. I, I guess it was last Friday or the Friday before last. Two gunmen on the Temple Mount, you know, where the, where the old temple was, the temple that's in the Bible was, there is now a mosque on that mount. And it's a disputed site and the Muslims kind of want it to be the capital of, uh, you know, their new Palestine went after they finished killing all the Jews. And, you know, no Jews can go up into the mosque and the mosque kind of dominates the view of Jerusalem. And there's a fly in the studio. Look at that. There's a fly in our studio. It's like, see if, see if you get them to do a guest spot. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so two gunmen kill cops, right? Two Palestinian gunmen kill cops. So the Israelis put up a metal detector to, to get into the mosque. The place goes nuts, right? There's rioting, there's uh, all this stuff. While the rioting goes on, a guy breaks into a Jewish home, a Palestinian breaks into a Jewish home and slaughters three people in this family. The poor, you know, mother is like locked in the room with the children, you know, the guy's coming, they, they have to rescue her and all this stuff. During these riots that the Palestinians, because they're putting security in, because there was a terrorist act, or as the New York Times said, an act that seemed like terrorism. I don't know what a guy killing, you know, a guy with guns killing a couple of cops is going to seem like. but. So they're rioting and three people are murdered in their home by a Palestinian terrorist and three Palestinians are killed in the riots, right? Because they're rioting. They are having riots. So the, the, the news all over, I'm quoting from CBS, but it was everywhere. Three Palestinians, three Israelis killed in violence over Jerusalem shrine. So like the entire moral framework of the news is completely removed. And that's a dishonest story. I mean, that's a dishonest story. This is not, this is not like yeah, he said, she said operation. Israel is a free nation. Israel is a place where women are free. Israel is a place where Muslims can worship. Islam is, uh, is, Israel is a place where Muslims can worship. Israel is a place where you can say what you want, where you can do the things that you want, or you can live a life and all this stuff. That is not true in any of the Muslim majority countries, even Turkey, which is slipping into Islamism as we watch. So the idea that Palestine, the Palestinians are made up, that we used to call them Philistines, that's what they're called in the Bible. The, the idea that Palestine should be a nation because we really need another oppressive Islamic nation and a free nation of Israel should be under fire and the killing that goes on at, in a house, a guy breaking his house and wiping out a family is the same morally as people getting, um, as people getting killed during, while they're rioting. It's, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's a big fantasy lie. And you know, this, the same thing, the fact, that, the fact that all they want to do, it's kind of like the protest is, what do you mean you're going to put up metal detectors? How will we get our guns in to kill you? I mean, that's what they're saying. It was like when they protested, they built that wall on the West Bank and they protested and, oh, remember what a terrible thing a wall was? I mean, that was the, the press was telling us, oh, how oppressive and how racist and it's apartheid. That wall essentially eliminated suicide bombings. It eliminated them coming across. So, so it's like they're protesting, hey, we can't kill you. It's not fair, you know? And this is this fantasy world that the press has created. And the point that I want to make about this, okay, is this is the same media that is reporting American news. The fantasy that is going on in Israel, this, that the, 
the world without a moral framework, the world where Israel and the Palestinians are on equal footing, where a terrorist act is the same as somebody getting killed while he's rioting, you know, all that stuff where that that framework of reality, of just an actual moral law. It's not, you know, it's not like a random moral law. It's not like I happen to be rooting for the Israelis. They're free country. I mean, this is the stuff that we're supposed to believe in. That same press is reporting on Donald Trump and it's reporting on this. I mean, there's another story that's going on right now is the murder rate is spiraling upward in Democrat cities and especially in Democrat cities where there has been Black Lives Matter activity in Baltimore. It's spiraling out of control. And they asked the police union. I mean, if you read any stories buried like down at the bottom, they asked the guy in the police union. This is where Freddie Gray. Remember, Freddie Gray was the guy who died in the paddy wagon, basically. And they said, well, they were trying to kill him. And they started to put the six officers. Freddie Gray was black. Three of the officers were black. Three of them were white. They started to put him on trial. Marilyn Mosby, was that the DA's name? And it was just, they, they started to get off and she finally had to drop the charges. And now the head of the police union in Baltimore says, oh, you know, it's in the officer's minds. Could I wind up being charged and being put in jail for doing my job? In other words, they're not policing with the same intensity they were. And now black people are getting killed. Thanks, Obama. Thanks, Black Lives Matter. I mean, these are the things that are going on while the press is reporting Jared Kushner is talking about some meeting he had about Russia. It's the same media. Michael Crichton, the great thriller writer, the guy who wrote Jurassic Park and so on, he was also a really uh, good political observer. And he once made the point, I've mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating. He once made the point that when you hit a news story that you know something about. So if I hit a news story that's about Hollywood, you know, about what business is like, doing business is like in Hollywood, you notice that they don't know what they're talking about. But then when you turn the page, and you go into the next story about Israel or Baltimore, you assume that they know what they're talking about because you don't know that information and you're getting it from the newspaper. So you start, it's just a psychological thing. So when these people who were lying so badly about Israel, who are just making up this fantasy Israel, who are not even talking about the fact that Black Lives Matter and Obama's uh, constant attacks on the police, which were a way of distracting the public and the press from the fact that his policies weren't working, when, when that stuff is all fantasy and you move on to Donald Donald Trump and you move on to what's happening and is the government in disarray and all this stuff. All that stuff is fantasy too. I mean, you have to start looking for, you know, you have to start looking for the stories themselves. You know, the funny thing about Trump, uh, about Trump and the Trump administration is I'm not a big fan of Trump as a human being. Like, I think I really don't like the bullying and I don't like the uh, rough talk and all this stuff. But I do understand that he did something important. He actually stopped the rolling tide of leftism that was engulfing the country and was really threatening to engulf the country and that it's still there. That rolling tide is still there. People who think that the Jews are the problem in the Middle East are still running our newspapers. People who think that the cops are the problem in black neighborhoods are still there. And the fact that Trump has put the brakes on them is important. It's important. He, and he's done good things. I mean, I think his, his foreign policy is better in the Supreme Court pick, obviously. I was reading in the Daily Wire, a lovely place where you, you should really subscribe to because, you know, if you subscribe for a year, you get the leftist tears mug. So you should really is worth doing. But I was reading in the Daily Wire that Trump has eliminated 16 federal regulations for each new one he's put in place. So, you know, I, I think that this this vision of the left is actually beginning to crack a little bit. I saw Chuck Schumer on TV and for the first time, Schumer was starting to talk about how losing the election was their fault. I mean, he was really blaming Hillary Clinton, but he was talking here. Here he is explaining what has gone wrong with the Democrat Party. Ready, comrades? Yes, comrade Borov. It's real cool. We got the red blue. 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 <laughs> now, that's an obscure joke you'll never hear anywhere else. You've got the red blues. No, but here is Chuck Schumer. Suddenly, they're, they're now going to bring out their Trumpian, Im their imitation Trump economic plan. Listen to this. When you lose an election by, with someone who has, say, 40 percent popularity, you look in the mirror and say, what did we do wrong? And the number one thing that we did wrong is we didn't have we didn't tell people what we stood for even today as your poll showed. They know we're standing up to Trump. They like that. But they want to know what do you stand for. So tomorrow, 
Democrats will unveil our economic agenda. It, it's called a better deal. It has three components. We're going to raise people's wages and create better paying jobs. We're going to cut down on their everyday expenses they have to pay, and we're going to give them the tools they need to compete in the 21st century. So simply put, what do Democrats stand for? A better deal for working families, higher wages, less costs, tools for the 21st century. You had president, century. though, for eight years, you had control of Congress for part of that time. What took so long and why didn't it happen during the campaign? Well, I don't know why it didn't happen in the campaign. We all take blame, not any one person. But now we have spent a lot of time working on this, and it's going to really impress the American people. Yeah, he dodged Stephanopoulos' question. Stephanopoulos blew the question. But the question is, you had eight years. Where were you on all these working class things when you were telling us who should be using the bathrooms in our elementary schools? Where were you, you know, when you were doing this, putting this anchor of Obamacare on our economy? Where were you while you were blame, uh, blowing up the Middle East? Where were you for the working class people? This is like imitation Trumpism. As you know, you know, the Democrats only have one policy forever for everything, which is steal people's money. From, one, from people who are productive and give it to people who aren't productive. And that's what they're going to do. When he says, oh, we're going to create jobs, you can't, government doesn't create jobs. The only jobs government creates are government jobs, which actually make fewer jobs because it, it, uh, everything that the government does is a weight on businesses. I got a break here to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube where you have been getting free video, but you can get video at the Daily Wire if you subscribe. If you subscribe, this is what you get for a lousy 10 bucks a month. You get to watch the video right there on the Daily Wire. You get to, uh, you can also, do you get ad-free Daily on Wire? If, you're, if you subscribe on the website, yeah, yeah, so that's pretty good too. You get to be in the mailbag where I solve all of your personal problems. I mean, look in the mirror, you know? I mean, is that not worth 10 bucks a month? And if you get it for a year, which is only a hundred lousy bucks a month, you get the Leftist Tears mug that keeps your Leftist Tears cold and my coffee warm. Come on over to thedailywire.com. Okay, so before we get to Knowles, let me just do a quick review of this new guy. Because this new guy, I, I was, I have to say, now, now that I feel fairly confident that Trump is not evil, that he's not going to be like an authoritarian, that he's not going to do anything to damage the actual polity of uh, the American polity, the American way of life. He may do things I hate. He may go too far to the left. He may mess things up and bobble the ball and all that. But now I'm convinced that he's not going to do anything really evil. I love how entertaining this all is. I mean, it's so much more entertaining than the last eight years of being scolded and having Obama shake his finger at us and tell us who we are as a people when he had no clue who we are as a people. And I was really sad when Sean Spicer stepped down because Sean Spicer made me laugh every time he was on TV when he would just say, it was, it was really like, Mr. Spicer, shut up. You know, I'll slap, I'll slap you around. You stuff. But I, I, this guy may be just as entertaining. I mean, he came, comes on. First, Spicer got a last hit. He was on Sean Hannity and he didn't say, the, the rumor is, the anonymous source story is that he didn't like Scaramucci. He didn't think he, he didn't want him to be his boss because now Scaramucci is over him. He's not the White House spokesman. The White House spokesman is uh, Huckabee Sanders. And so that was the rumor that that's why he quit. But he was very politic about all that. But he did have this to say about the press. Most people aren't really uh, privy to how stories are developed and what stories are um, make it to the front page or to uh, the mainstream media, whether it's in print or in broadcast. And I think they'd be shocked and disappointed to see uh, some of the bias that exists in some of the stories that don't get told or the manner in which they are told. Uh, I was increasingly disappointed in how oh, so many of the members here of the media do their job, or rather don't do their job, the bias to which they come from it at. Um, and as I mentioned a while ago, I think that has become a, a very clickbait mentality among a lot of reporters where they're more interested in their clip or their click than they are about the truth and the facts. So I think that's, that is certainly fair enough. So I like the fact that he had a parting shot at the press. And then Sarah Huckabee Sanders goes on with George Sakalopagus and, and this is, this is classic. I mean, this is classic. I, you know, we are so Democrat. We don't know how Democrat we are from the media. Listen to this question. I want to ask you the same question John Carl asked Sean Spicer on his first day. Do you promise to always try to tell the truth from that podium? 
Absolutely, and not just to you, but uh, I, I think that's our duty. Uh, certainly, uh, I have three young kids, and I want to be able to go home and look my kids in the eye every single day, and that's far more important to me uh, to be able to do that and have that the highest level of honesty and integrity. And I want to do that not just in my job, but in every single thing I do. And so uh, this is just an extension of me being able to do that, and I'm excited and honored to do it. That's so, so I, I thought she, what she should have said is me tell the truth. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> like you're asking, you are asking me if I will tell the truth. You're George Stephanopoulos. You said, I love you, Hillary. And now you're pretending to be a journalist. I, you know, I mean, this is the, I'm, I'm sure, I wonder, did they ask Josh Ernest that, Ernest that when he took over Obama's podium? Uh, I very, very much doubt it. I couldn't find, I couldn't find an interview that he did when he started, but I I doubt they were asking that question. The very question itself is offensive. I mean, the question itself is offensive. Do you swear to tell the truth? How about, you know, how, you know, like bite me, George. That's the answer to that question. So now they bring in Scar Scaramucci. And the thing about Scaramucci is he supported Obama for a while. He then supported Jeb, exclamation point, And he supported, who was the other one he supported? The Scott Walker, I think he supported. Uh, gave him money and talked to him. Up. And there's this old cut of him attacking Trump. Uh, Scaramucci was in business. Trump attacked his business. Uh, this is the this is the old. Let me see if I can find this. It is number two. Cut number two. He's a hack politician. Oh, He's probably going to make Elizabeth Warren his vice presidential nominee with comments like you think, that. You the politicians don't want to go at Trump because he's got a big mouth and he's afraid he's going to get light him up on Fox News and all these other places. But I'm not a politician. Yep. Yep. Bring it. Right, so you're, why, you're, is he, why is he you're, resonating? You're an inherited why is he money resonating? dude from Queens County. Bring it, Donald. <laughs> so bring it, Donald. <laughs> but, but I like Scar Scaramucci now goes on and Chris Wallace asks him, uh, you know, to, to respond to this. And this is cut number three. So this this Karamuchi, the thing I like about him is he sounds exactly like Donald Trump. He's like mini me Trump now. What I love about you guys, okay, is it's a three minute segment that I guess is gonna be played for eternity. We should put it on the Voyager spacecraft and send it interstellar, okay? No, I love no, the guy. Let me just We're say New Yorkers, and this is my point. I wanna finish my point. I love the guy. I have spent the last 18 months supporting him unyieldingly because he's a great person and he's gonna be a phenomenal, he is a phenomenal president. He's even gonna be a better president. Oh. But you're not allowed to fight a little bit amongst oh. your friends. If you're not allowed to do that and uh, what are we doing it's just like the new york the new york administration is like i love it. it's like the queens what are we doing here chris if we can't fight we can't fight and he talks about he talks about how he's going to solve uh the leak problem this is cut four tomorrow i'm going to have a meeting with the communications staff and say hey i don't like these leaks and so we're going to stop the leaks and if we don't stop the leaks i'm going to stop you it's just really that simple <laughs> So then he, that was yesterday, so now he implemented the program today. Most fun administration ever. I mean, a lot of this guy, this guy, this guy, they call him the Mooch. Mooch. He he made a speech today where he just talked about how wonderful Trump was and how he could. What did he say? He could throw a perfect spiral with a football through a tire. Yeah. <laughs> he is he really. I know, I know, but that's that's what I want in my president. I want a guy who can throw a perfect spiral through a tire. But I, I really like this guy. I think he's going to be every bit as entertaining as Sean Spicer. And that is the thing. I am here to be entertained. So that's what I want from this administration. All right, let's bring on Knowles. Knowles, are you there? Oh, my God. I, hey. I cannot believe. Hey, hey, Ed Knowles, <laughs> Michael, it's good to see you. I'm a New Yorker. You're a New Yorker. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> and don't mess with me, all right? Because I slap you upside the head. You got to see what I did to Ben to get this studio seat right now. We're broadcasting live from the Ben Shapiro show studio. We'll find him in like a bucket of lime. <laughs> so I feel like I just saw you ten minutes ago. We we had dinner last night with the 
absolutely beautiful and charming and intelligent and colder. My heart palpitations have finally quieted down she, enough so she, that I, oh my gosh, beating out of my chest. I know, she is so nice. You know, the funny the funny thing about Anne is like, she's like one of the nicest, she's just a charming, lovely person. That's and right. And when you tell people that, they say, oh, well then the whole thing on TV must be an act. And I think like, what is she? She's not mean on TV. She's just a conservative. <laughs> she's a conservative. She is extremely charming and she's extremely entertaining. Yeah, uh, that, that was my That's... experience <laughs> having dinner with her and having met her before. Well, she says she might come on the show. So hopefully, uh, hopefully she'll come on later this week while she's in L.A. So I asked you to look at Jay-Z and before you say I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to stand back and, and let you talk in just a minute. I just want to say this one thing. I know nothing about Jay-Z. I mean, the, everything I know about Jay-Z, I learned from Miley Cyrus, that song she has where she says a Jay-Z song. So that's the only thing I know about Jay-Z. And the reason I don't know anything about Jay-Z, I mean, I, I, I think in most of the arts, my my critical facility is still pretty cutting edge. I mean, I love new things. I've participated in a lot of new things. I've participated in a lot of new technology. I hate this music. And, I, and you know, I was thinking about this over the weekend in another for another reason, if you had lived from ancient Greece to, if you had lived in the centers of Western civilization from ancient Greece to say 1900 England, you know, Europe, you would never have heard music so loud that you couldn't hold a conversation or music that was, you know, drowned you out or music that made you bounce around like you were some kind of like primitive. And the fact that we listen to this music, that we have devolved to listening to music that just is, does not contribute to the beauty of life, does not contribute to the serenity of the soul, does not add anything to our depth of information, I think it's just a sign of decadence. <laughs> I think this stuff, this rock, rock is bad enough and I know that I sound like an old curmudgeon, but I, this on this one thing, I really do not think the arts have advanced, but rap to me is just trash. And having said that, you can now say anything you want about Jay-Z if you, if you like him, go ahead. But he brought out this new album, which is making a lot of a big splash. First, I'll say I am Wonder Mike, and I've come to say hello to the black and the brown, <laughs> the white and the purple and yellow. <laughs> this is not a test. I'm rapping to the beat. I, I agree with you. I, I try. This is the. I think the Ann Coulter dinner was my gift for getting through <laughs> listening to this stupid album. Uh, I don't like rap as a genre. I agree with you. I, I I just don't think it's a good genre. I know that's a sweeping statement, but I don't think it contributes very much uh, to the world or to my sense of aesthetics or beauty or truth or any, anything like that. Uh, that all said, uh, in its first week out, this, this album has made in, insane strides. Uh, a lot of people are saying it's going to be the album of the year. Puff Diggity Doodad or whoever <laughs> says that it's the best album Jay-Z ever made. And uh, What's the name of the album? Uh, the album is called 444. Okay. I looked up, I said, well, I wonder what that means. Yeah. But the, uh, JC, uh, Jay-Z says that he got the name because he woke up in the middle of the night at 444 and started writing a song. Uh, apparently that's as, as deep as it goes. Um, what's interesting, because Jay-Z, the musician, is far less impressive than Jay-Z, the businessman. <laughs> this guy, I mean, he's a billionaire. He, he, uh, he and Beyonce together are worth $1.1 to $1.2 billion. <sighs> okay. He explicitly released this album only on his own streaming music service. Wow. So he, it was a big risk because it couldn't be considered for the, the chart rankings. It couldn't be considered by Nielsen. But even in its second week, it had so much momentum behind it just from his own service that it, it rose to number one in the charts. Mm. So a really impressive uh, business acumen. Um, it, the album is, is deeply confessional. It's supposed to be a response to Beyonce's Lemonade album that came out yes, last year, which right. talked about his infidelities. It alluded to them. Uh, do we have a clip? There's a little promo that he's been putting out of the album. Do we have that? No, no. This is my... Everybody wants to be needed on some level. I feel like women often feel like you're a man. And it's just like, okay, so does that mean we don't have emotions? You know, people see your family, they see Instagram pictures of you smiling and happy and stuff all the time. They don't think you got real issues. You know what I mean? I don't mm -hmm. think you have to sleep back to back, like climbing in the bed and you like look over there and you got that back roll though. That's the worst <laughs> feeling in the world. <laughs> What I thought was when I met my dad was, oh, I'm free to love now. 
This is the softer side of Jay-Z. I mean, <laughs> okay. this, this is not the guy who rapped on the Black Album, I got the hottest chick in the game wearing my chain. You know, kind of. it, <laughs> it is a more probing uh, piece, but it's an album of, uh, of contradictions. On the one hand, Jay-Z explicitly kills his ego in a song. He's fighting his ego. Huh. He's fighting for his humility. Be the end of his career, probably. The end of his career, <laughs> yeah. yeah, his family. But on the other hand, the whole album is navel-gazing. It's all about his romantic problems about which I'm supposed to care for some reason. I mean, he's cheating on Beyonce, isn't that basically? He confesses to it yeah. in the album yeah, pretty explicitly. But, but then on the other hand, so many of the, the innovative songs in this album, or at least the innovative lyrics, are about taking personal responsibility responsibility, financial responsibility, familial responsibility. Then on the other hand, he airs racial grievance that ultimately excuses any sort of personal responsibility, uh, in particular in a song about uh, the, the real story of O.J. Simpson, which is a timely release. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the New York Times, a former newspaper, actually sort of got this right. They said, viewed from different angles, 444 is a long simmering eyes downcast confession, a, re a relaxing of muscles that have been tense for decades, a marketing ploy intended to bolster two second tier businesses, <laughs> the streaming service title and the phone company Sprint. Uh, both of those are present. Uh, he's getting plaudits from Monica Lewinsky for coming clean about his, uh, about his infidelities. He's getting plaudits from everybody. He said, quote, this is my real life. I just ran into this place and we built this big, beautiful mansion of a relationship that wasn't totally built on the 100% truth. Okay, tear this down. Let's start from the beginning. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. More power to him, obviously, as a Knowles myself. I always <laughs> like when the in-laws are, are good to our, our family Mommy members. and daddy are fighting, right? Yeah. But, but listen to some of these lyrics. I think they'll explain the, the nice attempts of the album and why this art form is, is just dreadful. Uh, you know, in the realm of ego, the first song opens up, it says, kill Jay-Z, they'll never love you, you'll never be enough. Let's just keep it real, Jay-Z. F Jay-Z. I mean, you shot your own brother. How can we know if we can trust Jay-Z? And you know better, N-word. I know you do, but you gotta do better, boy. You owe it to Blue, his daughter. You had no father, you had the armor, but you got a daughter. Gotta get softer. Die, Jay-Z. This ain't back in the days. Cry, Jay-Z. We know the pain is real, but you can't heal what you never reveal. Uh, a, okay. a vulnerable yeah. lyric. Right. Not a good lyric. Not Keats. <laughs> not not Wordsworth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, vulnerable, and, and in that way, I suppose, admirable. On financial responsibility, there's a great song in the album called Legacy, and it opens up with a little girl asking, Daddy, what's a will? And, <laughs> and it, he responds, he says, Take those monies and spread cross families. My sisters, Hattie and Lou, the nephews, cousins, and TT, Eric, the rest for B, whatever she wants to do, she might start an institute. Generational wealth, that's the key. My parents ain't have S, so that shift started with me. My mom took her money, she bought me bonds. That was the sweetest thing of all time. Mm. It's it's a, a really good message. So, so there's there's a little capitalism in there. Did that get a react? I mean, did that- It, it did. Some people called it a, a conservative album. Clearly, huh. uh, compared to his other material, it, it is. It's giving an important message about responsibility and, yeah. and wealth and, uh, and finance. But then here comes the chorus of that same song. Legacy, 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 black excellence, you're gonna let him see. Legacy, 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 black excellency, baby, let him see. Uh, later on, uh, he, he uh, from the song Family Feud, he says, you all still drink in Perrier's UA, ha, huh? but we ain't get through to you yet, uh. What's better than one billionaire too, especially if they're from the same hue as you? Uh, you all stop me when I stop telling the truth. There's a, a black solidarity and a, a racial grievance that, that permeates a lot of the <laughs> album. Uh, from the, the story of OJ, uh, uh, one of the bigger songs, it it's, uh, has a video on YouTube. We can't play it because it'll get our, our own content taken down. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because they've been very strong on copyright. He says, you want to know what's more important than throwing away money at a strip club? Credit. Good point. <laughs> You ever wonder why Jewish people own all the property in America? <laughs> this is how they did it. <laughs> Financial freedom is my only hope. F living rich and dying broke. Uh, I can't wait to give this S to my children. Y'all think it's bougie. I'm like, it's fine. All a great message. In bougie meaning bourgeois. Bourgeois, yeah. we're coming from bourgeois. Uh, but then, uh, then we get to the chorus. Light N-word, dark N-word, faux N-word, real N-word, rich N-word, poor N-word, house N-word, field N-word, still N-word, still n -word. Huh. Uh, 
it's Jay Z. Yeah. Maybe many things. Yeah. <laughs> a mediocre lyricist, <laughs> an impressive businessman, but he is no N word. <laughs> no, I mean if that's if that if that is N word, like sign me up. He's sign like, me up. a billionaire. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's a billionaire. He's, he's exceeded beyond anyone, even even in his own industry. But but certainly uh, he's made <laughs> over a billion dollars of wealth, and he's one of the most prominent artists of uh, of our time, which says quite a lot about our art time. and our time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for doing that. So I didn't have to. Uh, when, when does your show start? You pushed it a week, right? We had to push it a week because I'm still recovering from listening to Jay-Z. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. <laughs> but we'll be we'll be beginning very soon. Very soon. Sooner even than you think. Okay. <laughs> and I would like to say before we go, I would like to thank Jay, uh, you know, just from my heart yeah. for uh, for apologizing to uh, to Cousin Bay. Was, uh, <laughs> you're a big man for doing it. Hopefully the music's a little better next time. It's nice to know the Knowles' stick together. We right? stick together. That's right. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I'll see you later. Uh, all right. Well, I, I, I couldn't contribute to that because I just don't, cannot listen to that music. I will say this, though, about about a black guy, a you know, prominent black guy saying that even if he's doing it through victimology, saying that success is the best revenge, because I think that that is what has motivated a lot of people from the Irish and the Italians and the Jews to, you know, like, yeah, you can pick on me now, but I'm going to build up my wealth. I'm going to do the job. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to get to college. I'm going to, you know, build a business and make it. And that really has been the way forward. And there, I have to say, there is one thing I have never understood as a man. You know, I, I, I'm not a big, I, I kind of believe race is a superstition. I mean, I believe in culture, but race to me, I, I doubt there's enough gen genetic difference between a black person and a white person and a yellow person to make any real difference. They couldn't be dispelled by culture within a generation. I think there are two kinds of people, men and women. I think those are the two kinds of people. Those are the two people who are different. Those are the two kinds of people that are different from one another. I think a black man and a white man have as much in com have so much more in common than any man and <laughs> any woman, basically. Basically, and what I've never been able to understand is the Democrats sell black men this helplessness and this poor little you. You're also picked on. You can't do it without the government, but we'll help you. You know, I know you can't. You can't even run a bank. Remember, remember, was it Maxine Waters who said that you can't even open a bank account? Oh, the government has to help you. That uh, anybody said that to me, I would stick my fist so far down his throat he would be sitting on it. I mean that I do not understand why they buy that message. Whereas the message from a guy, it's, it's white people who attack a guy like Jay Z when he says make a lot of money. They say, oh no no no, you don't want to do that. You want to be helpless and victim. You know you can't you can't succeed until people stop hating you. People never stop hating you. There'll always be someone who hates you. There'll always be a grievance. You'll always be a victim of something. But if you get ahead and become a billionaire, it's a lot more fun to be, you know, hated and a victim. I just have never understood why black males buy into that, you know, that you need to be taken care of by the government. That would just like go right up my, my spine. I would, I would hate it. All right. Stuff I like. I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to review Dunkirk. I know a lot of people love this film. Christopher Nolan's new film about, I mean, this was one of the, you know, when I lived in England, they used to joke about this all the time because they used to say, it, you know, they would never win in athletics. They would never win at Wimbledon. They would never win at soccer, you know, which they call football. They would never win at, you know, rugby or anything. And they would say, well, it's the Dunkirk spirit. We lose, but we lose beautifully. And, and Dunkirk is one of the great losses. You know, it was a military disaster. The British forces and the French forces were pushed to the sea by the Germans. The Germans held off wiping. They could have just moved in and wiped them out, but they didn't. And in an absolute military miracle, I mean, this is just history. I, I hope I'm not giving you, I, you know, if this is, if this for you is a spoiler, turn me off now, because I will tell you what happened in, in history. But in one of the great military miracles of history, like every British guy with a boat, which was everybody on the coast, got in their boats, sailed across with the RAF protecting them in the air and brought back hundreds of thousands of soldiers and saved the war, basically saved the war. So it is an amazing, amazing story. People loved this film and I I thought it was a good movie. It was, first of all, it's under two hours, which I think every movie that's under two hours is better than every other movie that is longer. It's immersive, the action. Did you see it, Austin? No, but I've heard a lot of good things about it. I mean, it, people, people loved it and it's just, 
it's immersive it's beautifully shot it's wonderfully acted it is it is very much like it's, it's exciting and it gets you in the battle there's not one human relationship in the entire movie not one i mean there's one there's two kids who kind of have a relationship there is no mourning there is no memory there is nothing that relates anything to anybody but just trying to survive in this battle which isn't actually realistic i mean even when you're trying to survive you are thinking about human relations and there there is something about Christopher Nolan who is so talented and so brilliant and has made a couple of films that I really liked I loved uh, um, the one about the guy who loses his memory what's that uh, who's memento? yeah memento and, and I love the Dark Knight film and, and all that and uh, and I love the fact that he's obviously a conservative and one of the things I liked about Dunkirk is that it is an openly patriotic film although they never mention it starts out with a, a thing that says the enemy has pushed the troops to the sea and you think the enemy huh? it would be the Germans <laughs> it would be the, the, the enemy had a name but he doesn't do any of that but it is an openly patriotic and openly pro-western film and it's that I, I like that so it's a good movie it's a good movie but it is kept from being a great movie by a problem Nolan has with his sterile approach to humanity I mean he does not he has not yet learned to tell a story about the way people feel about each other and that's what stories are about i mean stories are not just about this guy did this what you know what this was it was like a dramatized documentary it was a dramatized documentary so well dramatized so anyway if if you want to see uh well since we're talking about stuff i like i think i've recommended this once before but it's worth saying again if you want to see a really fine film uh about war Take a look at the Dawn Patrol, 1938. This is um, it's Basil Rathbone, David Niven, and Errol Flynn. Errol Flynn is the big star of this. It was written by a guy who uh, was an American writer, John Saunders, who uh, said to th the fact that he couldn't get into combat as a flyer uh, with the U.S. Air Force, so he wrote about this. And what I've always loved about this film is it's 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 almost a comedy about the fact this is World War One people flying in World War One, and the flyers in World War One, like would just get shot out of the sky constantly and they were just constantly being killed and they sing a song in this movie, uh, hurrah for the next man who dies and everything is a joke. They just turn everything into a joke and it, it works in kind of a, um, a reflective way that because these guys are always drinking and always kidding around, you start to realize they're they're going to die they're on death's edge all the time and here's a scene where David Niven as a flyer has been shot down and somehow he makes his way back behind from behind enemy lines he makes his way back to the tavern where Errol Flynn greets him and they're all drinking and getting drunk but what he doesn't realize is the guy who shot him down the German who shot him down is being held prisoner in this tavern and has been allowed to get completely smashed they love him these they're being friendly they don't care you know it's, it's not about it's not personal and it's just a it's a great depiction of men in war living for the moment and it really is intense here's a, a brief scene of that uh, tavern scene and the stretch of banner pouring some rum down my throat oh you should have some of that rum you didn't have any did you? <laughs> no, no. just a couple of drops but i stopped for some refreshment on the way back and i brought these whoa. come on whoa. open them up whoa. open them up whoa. 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 Uh, what's that oh well that's the man that brought you down who introduce him will you perhaps Das ist der Herr, den Sie Herr Huntergebracht haben. Den Herr Huntergebracht habe? Ja. Ja. Oh! Oh, oh, oh. Das wäre ein ganz großes Vergnügen. Das freut mich aber sehr. Du bist mein Freund. Verstehst du? Du bist mein Freund. What's he say? As I don't know. Right. He just wants him to have a drink. Oh, drink. <laughs> a drink. <laughs> But drinks. <laughs> Whoop, whoop, please. Don't waste it. Come on. <laughs> so that's it. Just goes, it's just the drinking and the fight, and it's all it's like so much fun. Except it's all about death. The whole movie's about death. It's really good and great flying footage. Some of the best flying footage ever. Dawn Patrol. Um, tomorrow we have Carrie Lucas on, who you may not have heard of, but she is a woman who runs the Independent Women's Voice, which is trying to fight back against "Take Care of Me" feminism by teaching women about the value of liberty and free markets. So that should be an interesting conversation. I will be here as well, so that'll be a little less interesting. But uh, but I'll do my best. I'm Andrew Claven. This is the Andrew Claven Show. We will see you then. <laughs>